Ladies and gentlemen, Adam Hall. somewhat opinionated uh, perspective on technology and education with the hope that you'll walk away from this presentation inspired, confident, motivated, all of the above, I hope. And a little bit about myself before we begin, I'll reiterate uh, some of what was said there by Jay. I live in sunny, warm, tropical Fort Myers, Florida. I know I'm supposed to endear myself to you, I don't know if that did. We are the home of the Red Sox uh, spring training. Florida is a little bit slow for this uh, city boy. I uh, lived about a third of my life in Funfield, Manhattan. Uh, earned a degree from Columbia University in economics. Uh, stuck around for as long as I possibly could until uh, settling down became the preferred option. I live in Fort Myers, Florida with my lovely wife Angie and our three beautiful babies, Chloe Grace, who's four, Charlotte Rose, who is two, and Cooper Fox, who is five months old. And I mention the children and their ages because I'm hoping to connect with some of you in the audience who are parents of multiple young children. Um, I believe we share one of those precious, indelible, and often painful bonds, don't we? Um, how many in the room have uh, multiple children under the age of four? God bless us. <laughs> that was a wonderful thing. Um, by way of my professional background, I served most recently as president of Skills Tutor for uh, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Is anyone here familiar with Skills Tutor or Skills Bank? Anybody familiar with Houghton Mifflin Harcourt? <laughs> okay, well that's where I worked. Um, before joining HMH, I was the co-founder and CEO of Impact Education, which is, was a small distribution and consulting firm, software distribution and consulting firm uh, that uh, I sold to, to HMH in 2010. And I stayed on for two years to see through the integration of the two companies. And looking back, I definitely enjoyed experiencing the entrepreneurial world of a startup company and then transitioning into the massive global publisher as a cog in the wheel. It really gave me a very different and valuable perspective on, edu on the education market and the dynamics. However, for reasons, many of which are underscored by the content of this presentation, I chose to leave the big education company world and get back to my roots as an entrepreneur and a person who really wants to see things done a different way, a better way. So currently, I'm in the middle of starting up a new business uh, in the brain science space that correlates brainwave activity with, uh, well, sp specifically attention levels, with uh, what's going on in the learning environment, with the goal being to understand what modalities and other factors influence attention levels and then to use those data to help personalize the learning experience for every child. I would say it's not brain science, but it's brain science. Uh, in my spare time, I serve on the school board of our local Catholic high school in Fort Myers. I serve on the education board of directors for SIIA, the Software Information Industry Association. Uh, I'm on multiple committees for, for COSIN, Consortium for School Networking. Uh, serve on the board of directors for an instructional software company out of the UK called Penda. Uh, and I'm consulting for an assessment company based out of Dublin, Ireland and Sydney, Australia called Vernocity. Uh, coach freshman football and I like to fish. So that's, that's who I am. So, what I'd like to talk about today is technology and specifically why technology has not revolutionized education, nor brought about the utopian system that many of us might have expected by now. But more important to address why I think it still can, and even more important, why I think it still should. And please be warned that some of what I might say you may disagree with, and that's perfectly fine. This is not the White House versus Congress. There's no sequester looming over our heads. Um, I assure you, though, that we are on the same, the same team here. I also ask that you please keep an open mind. So, let's start looking at the reality of the past 25 years in education with a specific lens focused on technology and an even more focused lens on, what, uh, on to what extent technology has delivered a more efficient system. And before we go there, let's make sure we're on the same page with definitions because I believe that words are important in this case. A more efficient system assumes a system where we're doing more with less. And I know that's a painful phrase for many of you out there. 
But I'm not talking about doing more with less because we have to. I'm talking about doing more with less because we want to. A more efficient system is one where we're able to handle increased capacity without a relatively equal drain on resources, either financial, human, or whatever. It's where teachers have more time to teach. It's where administrators have more time to administrators have more time to administer. It's a function of time versus output. An improved system assumes that we are producing more at a better quality at a speedier rate. Now given the industry of education, this means more graduates, smarter graduates who are better equipped to compete in an increasingly competitive global economy. So back now to how technology has delivered or not delivered a more efficient and improved system, the reality is that technology can deliver a better system, it just arguably has not. Technology can be functional in that context. However, we collectively have been, and to a large extent remain, dysfunctional. We as an ecosystem of teachers and administrators, publishers, developers, marketers, salespeople, the EdTech market dynamic as a whole is dysfunctional. Now I'm going to pause there. Are we still friends? <laughs> I hope so. <clears throat> Think about it. Why has technology revolutionized every other industry but education? It's done so because those markets in those industries were functional enough prior to the application of technology to withstand and be tremendously enhanced by technology. The market dynamics were stable, and technology simply offered a way to exponentially augment what it was already a functional system. It's much more difficult to extrapolate that to the education, uh, the scenario of an education market. And most of this presentation is going to focus on, on just why that is. Before I go on, I want to put forth an important what-if scenario to you all. What if all employees in the vendor companies who conduct business in the education market, be it basal or supplemental, uh, print or digital, uh, uh, content or platform, what if all of those employees were required to take a crash course in education prior to starting their job? And conversely, what if every educator, from teacher to superintendent, were required to take a crash course in business? Think about that. And please keep that in mind throughout this presentation because we're going to come back to it at the end. In a business to business transactional scenario, where let's say a car company that produces and sells cars uh, needs to purchase materials and parts, such as tires, to make those cars, the company is constantly thinking the following We must deliver the best product at the least cost for the highest price to maximize the return to our shareholders. In order to do this, we must refine our operations, make them as efficient as possible, while maintaining the, the highest quality of output. We are driven by high quality and efficiency because the market demands it. It's not optional. It's pretty much a requirement. It's a given if we want to remain competitive. So to achieve that requirement, we as a car manufacturing company turn to our tire supplier and say, Mr. Tire Supplier, we need you to do better. Whether it be higher quality or cheaper tires, we are demanding you give us the best tire you can, and we're going to be quite specific about what we expect. We need more tread. We need stronger rubber. We need higher uh, safety ratings, whatever. And what does Mr. Tire Supplier say? Okay, you got it. We're on it. But Mr. Tire Supplier also says, you know, we have our own market forces to contend with. We have our own shareholders. We have our own competition to think about. And Mr. Tire Supplier pushes back on the car company to the extent he can until a nice equilibrium is reached and it all balances out. And theoretically, we're getting the highest quality tires at the highest yield in the most efficient manner which leads to the highest quality cars, to the highest yield, in the most efficient manner. And no, I'm not here to teach you Econ 101, but I'm also not even going to bother asking you the question of whether or not that market dynamic, that, that uh, uh, efficiency as a market dynamic, even exists 
in the education technology context? Because the answer is a big no. Now, <clears throat> let me pause and clearly and emphatically state the following. Students are not cars. Schools are not car companies. I do not sell tires or manufacture them. However, we as a society, we seem to demand more from cars and tires than we do from students and schools. And note that I use the word demand and not expect. Of course we expect more from our students and our schools. Look at Common Core. The whole premise behind Common Core is to establish expectations of, of excellence and attempt the best we can nationally to address the inherent inequity among those expectations. But do we demand more? Demand is an economics term. It affects market behavior. It has consequence built into it. I'm not a professional educator. I'm a businessman. And it took me quite a long time to be proud of that when talking to educators. I'm coming at this from the other side, which should actually help lend credibility to what I'm saying here, because in dissecting and criticizing the dynamics around how educators and vendors interact in a market dynamic, I'm somewhat throwing myself and my publishing brethren under the bus to a large extent. Honestly, education publishing has had it kind of easy over the past 25 years, in large part because much was expected, very little demanded. The fact is, right, rather than bilaterally engaging you all in a healthy and intense dialogue around what you demand and what we are willing and able to provide and, and at what cost, We've glad-handed one another. We've maintained a, a comfortable yet far from ideal status quo. Instead of a dialogue that would drive innovation from our side and improved process from your side, I, representing my side, have engaged you in relationship building. I've striven to become your bosom buddy. You, pro you procured books and software for me for decades, and we've both been quite satisfied to do, to do the same old thing. It's really true of uh, textbook and supplementals. You're not asking too much for me. I'm not on the hook to give too much to you. The money's there because the taxpayer is putting the bill, and all is copacetic. And I guess all is copacetic until you look at the following. The quality of our collective product could be a lot better i.e., we could be delivering more learned learners who are better equipped to compete globally. We collectively could be better positioned among our competition, i.e., our global rankings leave much to be desired. Our collective margin of error could be lower. We could have far fewer dropouts. Our collective efficiency rates could be higher. We could be doing more with less. Teachers could have more time to teach. Our mutual shareholders could be happier. Taxpayers could have more faith in the education system. It's really not copacetic when you look at it from that perspective. But the hard truth is, that is the perspective that dominates current thinking, at least among industries outside education. And it's that thinking driving all those industries that have been revolutionized by technology. And that's where I'm going with this. It's time that we agree, collectively, to break this cycle of mutual satisfaction with the status quo and mediocrity and recognize that we are paying a huge opportunity cost by not using technology to its fullest to achieve improved systems and improved output. So you might be scratching your head thinking, well, wait a second. You know, we've had technology for decades and then we've invested in it, and we've done our part, we've, we've, we've invested in trainings, and here we are. But that sad truth hones in further on my point that it's not the technology's fault, at least not fully. Rather, it's the fact that we've expected technology to miraculously deliver outcomes without demanding from ourselves the discipline implementation factors that are required to fulfill those expectations. Here's a scenario of a real-life initiative where disciplined implementation factors may be lacking. It's one where I'm involved as a school board member. As I mentioned earlier, I'm on the school board of the local Catholic high school in Fort Myers. 
And I stated the example is uh, uh, that the di discipline implementation factors may be lacking because we're literally right in the middle of this and it can go one of two ways. The school has worked to raise enough money to implement an iPad initiative for the incoming freshmen next year. And the school administration, in conducting its due diligence, has visited the local diocese nearby who is much further along in the same sort of implementation of the uh, iPad implementation. And they've considered it a successful implementation thus far. We've been taking notes, being quite valuable. However, there's one underlying implementation factor that really is bothering me, and it's a doozy. Since our school is uh, a few years away from its next textbook adoption, the plan is to have the students access their current textbooks by PDF, photocopies, with the publisher's permission, of course. That mentality is stuck in the old paradigm. I mean, they can digitize the book, they can digitize the chalkboard, they can di digitize the boring old lecture, but they're basically just replicating traditional methods by a really cool new medium. What they should be doing, and what I'm advocating strongly for at the board level, is to think about using iPads and the surrounding technologies to do entirely new things that weren't even possible before. An example is, look at the function of time versus learning. In our old, or sadly current, paradigm, we have held time constant and kept learning variable. Right? There are a certain number of hours in the school day, there's a specific curriculum and pacing guide that we follow. Teachers introduce a concept on Monday, they finish by Friday. A third of the kids have the concept mastered by Wednesday. A third of them still don't get it by Friday. And that leaves the sum or the majority of the kids either bored or frustrated as they move on to the next week's topic and the whole cycle perpetuates. Time is constant, learning is variable. Given an iPad initiative, should we apply the inverse of the time learning function? Shouldn't the learning be constant and the time variable? Using my iPad, I can learn anytime, anywhere. There's no fixed period of time. The constant, the must have, should be that I actually master the concept before moving on to more complex content. If the school implements the iPad initiative with efficiency and efficacy driving every implementation factor, it will succeed and it will end up being the flagship technology school in Southwest Florida. I'm very confident. We shall see. Is anyone here familiar with Project RED? Good. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Project RED, it is the culmination of some really fantastic and seminal research conducted by two of our well-known colleagues, Tom Greaves and uh, Jeannie Hayes. Some of you may know them. I'll give you the Reader's Digest version of uh, the research. The hypotheses were threefold. Properly implemented educational technology can substantially improve student achievement. Properly implemented education technology can be revenue positive at all levels, local, state, federal. Continuous access to computing devices for every student leads to increased academic achievement and financial benefits, especially when technology is properly implemented. Those are the hypotheses, they're fair hypotheses. The research talks about first order changes, second order changes, uh, radical improvements that ultimately address or satisfy the grand challenges put forth in the 2010 National Edu Educational Technology Plan, which I know many of you are familiar with. The fourth grand challenge of that plan talks about delivering a system where students learn at twice the rate and half the cost. Definition of efficiency. Anyway, given those hypotheses, I'm going to summarize Project Red's findings, which I find very interesting, and there are seven. The first, there are nine key implementation factors linked most strongly to education success. I'll leave it to you to go look, look up the nine factors, but there are nine factors. Second, properly implemented technology saves money. These are the results. Three. One-to-one -one schools employing key implementation factors outperform all schools and all other one-to-one -one schools. Four, the principal's ability to lead change is critical. That's an implementation tactic. Five, technology-transformed intervention improves learning. That implies effective implementation. Six, online collaboration increases learning productivity and student engagement. 
again, an implementation tactic. And finally, daily use of technology delivers the best ROI, return on investment. Again, that's an implementation tactic. Every one of these findings either explicitly mentions or strongly implies implementation as a critical factor of success for outcomes, successful outcomes. The technology itself is not the factor. It's implementation. It's you. It's me. It's us. If technology is not transforming our schools, it's not because we don't have access to the right ingredients. It's because we're not following the detailed recipe. I propose to you that we as an ecosystem, educator and vendor, are to blame for this, that we have not shared, refined, and stuck to a tried and true recipe for success in the context of ed tech. But I also propose to you that we are the only ones that can fix this. The educator and the vendor, you and me, not the taxpayer, not the student, not the parent, educator and vendor. I'm producing a mediocre solution because you're willing to buy a mediocre solution and then apply mediocre training, at least a mediocre implementation, and you get mediocre results, and we all sit there and wonder what happened. If you demand more from me, I will be forced to deliver more to you. If you commit to not just adopting technology for technology's sake, but commit to true and sustained fidelity of implementation, I assure you, you will get results. Part of that commitment is shifting your mentality away from technology as an add-on. You know what really gets me? Is when a textbook salesperson throws in technology as gratis to win a big textbook deal, sweeten the pot. This happens all the time in textbook adoption cycles. It sends the complete wrong message. It's reacting to the paradigm without shifting with the paradigm. Imagine living in 15th century Europe. And let's say I'm the business partner of Johann Gutenberg, the guy who invented the printing press. And my job up to this point was to sell papyrus, uh, ink, and quail pens to the local monasteries, whose job it was to meticulously copy the Bible word for word for mass distribution throughout Europe. And one day, my business partner, Johan, comes up to me and says, Adam, you've got to check this out. I have this really cool new invention. It's called a printing press. And I'm just so excited about this thing. And the first thing I do is draft up a marketing flyer. Attention monks, free printing press with every 100 quail pens. <laughs> got to have those quail pens. Can't get rid of those quail pens. OK, that painful analogy aside, I would argue that what I've just described sadly, illustrates our current reality more than one would like to admit from a vendor ed educator perspective. I'm not saying there aren't pockets of brilliance, okay? It's not a big blob of dark matter. There are many schools and districts doing it right, and many companies are responding accordingly. After all, this is Massachusetts, and if there's a choir to preach to anywhere, it's right here. But on a national level, I believe the reality of the paradigm I'm describing is valid. Which leads to the section of the presentation that I call the inevitability. We don't really have a choice here. The option to react to the paradigm of technology in education, rather than shift with it, is disappearing. As every industry surrounding education shifts, revolutionizes, reinvents itself, the glaring dichotomies and inconsistencies between those industries and education will become more and more painful to number one, acknowledge, and number two, accept and live with. So I recently traveled to India, and during a visit to the schoolhouse in Pune, I was struck by the eerie similarities to the classrooms here in the US. This was one of the poor public schools in Pune. <laughs> There was no air conditioning. The walls desperately needed spackling and paint. The kids wore tattered uniforms. They sat at old, worn out desks. The infrastructure was generally poor, and poor infrastructure is generally a fair descriptor of India. Not a pejorative one, but a fair one. But you know what I saw, what I did see? Textbooks, a teacher, 
lecturing her students, who all faced forward in rows in those old rickety desks, reciting, regurgitating. I had the chance to address the class for 30 minutes. They spoke surprisingly good English, actually. And as I answered their questions about Miley Cyrus, you guys know me well enough now to know that. Now, that's a tough conversation to have. <laughs> uh, and President Obama, which was a much easier conversation to have. I intuitively pulled out my iPhone to assist me, to show pictures and videos. These kids had never seen an iPhone. These kids lived in shacks. One of their chores, which when I witnessed it, I took for playing in the mud, okay? I'm sitting there thinking of my little four-year-old Chloe as I'm watching this little girl play in the mud and build her little mud castle. And I'm enjoying this little moment of innocence and playtime. And then my colleague Nazneen walks up to me. She's from Pune. She says, oh, she's, uh, she's making cow dung pancakes. Excuse me? I got to snap out of my little wonder world. Cow, cow dung what? Nazneen proceeded to explain to me what a cow dung pancake is and why this little girl is crafting them. This little girl was not playing in the mud. Rather, she was doing one of her daily chores. She was fashioning and molding cow dung into pancakes that when you dry them, they serve as very as slow burning fuel to heat her family's meals. You think my paradigm didn't shift? You think they weren't blown away by the iPhone? I found out later that most of these children had never seen an American, let alone had a QA with one. The surroundings and general resources available to that school in Pune were far less comfortable and refined than what we have here in the US, but the paradigm was generally the same. They have an excuse to function in that paradigm. I propose to you that we do not have an excuse. Now, I believe very strongly we have an overall better system over here than they do in India. Don't get me wrong. It's not nearly as good as it could be. We simply don't have an excuse. Why aren't we flipping classrooms in math and science for populations where we know it works? I know many of you are, but not enough. Why aren't we committing to comprehensive and sustained professional development around how to best implement technology in education? Why aren't we implementing one-to-one -one across the board? Again, preaching, preaching to the choir for many of you. Why aren't we implementing bring-your-own-device programs that are working tremendously or having tremendous success across the country? Why aren't we demanding from the private sector, interoperability across the board, content, assessment, RTI, gradebooks, attendance, behavior, IEPs, AIPs, SIS, free and reduced lunch, race, age, gender, disability, all in the cloud, with a single sign-on app that allows me anytime, anywhere, any device access. Why aren't you demanding that from me? Why am I not building that for you? The technology exists. And it can and will do the job if we come, to get, come together collectively and demand a more efficient, more market-driven way, market way of doing business. I use the term inevitability to describe how technology will fundamentally change how we behave as an ecosystem of vendors and educators because if it does not happen, then I don't see how the education system as we know it can survive. The broader market will abandon it, plain and simple. It's painfully, glaringly obvious that every other industry has revolutionized itself with the appropriate, sustained, juried, and relentless application of technology. Auto assembly lines are powered by robots, building faster, better, cheaper, more efficient auto automobiles. The once line workers have improved their skill set in such a way that they now operate those robots. I would argue that teachers might improve and adapt in a similar fashion given appropriate, sustained, juried, relentless application of technology to the educational process. Look at the other, other industries, freight, land, air, and sea, the stock market, telecommunications and media, social media, e-commerce, the list goes on and on and on. If education continues to deliver the same levels of, of output with the same failed applications of technology, it will cease to exist as we know it. It will buckle under taxpayer dissatisfaction and certain trends already reflect cracks in the foundation. Look at the increased popularity of homeschooling. Look at charter schools. Look at virtual schools. 
The OECD projects that by 2025, there will be 265 million students ready to enter college. To accommodate for that demand, if, if we stick to the quail, the quail pen paradigm, we would need to build four universities the size of UMass Amherst per week for the next 15 years. I don't know about you, but I just don't see that happening. <laughs> By the way, I need to give credit to Richard Collada, who used that factoid in uh, one of his TED Talks. So, thanks. thanks, Richard. Point is, we collectively as an ecosystem, public and private, can do better. I'm not suggesting that we adopt the same philosophies of the corporate world. I'm not suggesting that. But we need to voluntarily and intentionally subscribe to some of the same disciplines that are a natural byproduct of the corporate world. In the corporate world, assuming generally free markets, this takes care of itself because of the, of the market forces and dynamics we talked about. Our reality is different, and for many good reasons, such as the fact that students are not products. But we should still demand discipline from ourselves and excellence as a result. We need to open our eyes and force ourselves to see what it's costing us to do it the same old way. Not the direct costs, the opportunity costs. We either do it now, voluntarily and intentionally, and start to manifest efficiencies, improve processes, and fix what's broken, or it becomes so painfully obvious that we have our heads stuck in the dark ages with Gutenberg's business partner that the whole thing is working. So that gets us to the, well, how do we do it? The how has everything to do with a bilateral commitment between you, me, educator, vendor, that we will change. The commitment will be to weave technology so intricately, so ubiquitously into the fabric of education that we won't remember how we got along without it. For instance, how many of you who have iPhones or Blackberries, how, how many of you ever survived without your, your, your iPhone? Or feel like you ever could have survived? I know I, I'm one of those people. One of Steve Jobs' main goals was to give you the ability to intuitively do things you hadn't even realized you wanted or needed to do. Your phone is your alarm clock, it's your calculator, it's your radio, it's your TV, it's your calendar, it's your video conference tool, it's your, it's your, it's everything. In education, what are the must-haves but we don't know what they are yet? That can be delivered and driven by, by technology. I'm not proposing that we do away with pedagogy, not at all. You all are the experts around how a student learns and how to teach that student. I'm proposing we have an educational system so refined through technology that if one day we feel like teaching with a chalkboard or keeping a written grade book or paging through a hardcover textbook, we can because we choose to step away from the refined, efficient systems for reasons that are whatever they are, perhaps nostalgia, perhaps you just like the feel of paper and chalk. The point is, at that juncture, where you are choosing to step away from the refined, efficient system, you're doing so because you have a choice to do so. Right now, we don't have a choice. We do things the way we do them because that's the only way to do them, or it's the, one we, it's the only way we trust, right? Technology right now is the alternative option, at best, and a risky, dysfunctional one at worst given poor implementation and uh, mediocre solutions. In a new scenario, where our collective ecosystem has made mutual commitments to one another, where we've committed to the specs and delivery and interoperability and training and sustained use of a paradigm-shifting system, we've empowered ourselves with choice. We can choose to let the refined system do most of the work, or we can choose to do it old school, if we feel like it. At that point, if one chooses to implement a classroom dynamic similar to the one I witnessed in India, it's by choice and not by necessity. It's similar to why I might drive a 57 Chevy versus a new Camaro with all the bells and whistles and the features I can't even think about. Or similar to owning and playing an old record collection versus the more convenient MP3. How many of you shop on Black Friday? Okay, okay. I thought there would be more. Uh, what is the alternative to Black Friday? Cyber <laughs> Monday. So some of you, a few of you, may take masochistic satisfaction in fighting those crowds and competing for the deals and you know, taking in the holiday spirit. 
instead of getting the same or better deals from the comfort of your couch and your pajamas. You may choose to punish yourselves. Trust me, I'm the Cyber Monday guy, all the way. Point is, there's a choice. Choices. You don't have them unless you refine your system so well that you can rely upon it to the point where you can choose to step away from it. Isn't that why we strive to get a good education in the first place, to have choice? If I drop out, I'm narrowed into a fast food job. If I get a degree, then my window of opportunity widens and I have choices. That education is what empowers me to ultimately have choice. Technology, applied in the right way, will ultimately empower those in the education system, teachers, students, administrators, parents, to have choice and be more effective in their particular role. Imagine the day when, years from now, a teacher brings in her, to her classroom for show and tell her old social studies textbook. And the kids marvel in awe of how ridiculously difficult it must have been for their beloved teacher to be so limited by a book. And Billy asks, well, what did they do if they printed a mistake? Or what did they do if history, for whatever reason, proved wrong, or they had to make a change? Or how did they keep information current? Keep in mind that for a digital native, current is right now. Just past. That was current. Billy will expect immediate gratification. We need to demand it for him. Here are two photos of what French illustrators in the year 1900 envisioned the world looking like in the year 2000. You got a classroom, familiar paradigm, right? With kids using a contraption, illustrating as best they could their concept of what I imagine is a computer, how on earth could they have visualized accurately what would ultimately evolve from that concept? It reminds me of the ending of Back to the Future when Marty McFly and Doc are throwing junk and trash into the flex capacitor for fuel. No? Okay. What's <laughs> that? The banana peel, exactly. Well, it's not a banana, but it's a textbook. And here's another airplane taxis. These illustrators back in 1900 could imagine what flight might have looked like. And it just so happened that flight actually occurred eight years later in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina with the Wright brothers. But these artists, couldn't imagine at the time what airports would actually look like or just how massive and far-reaching and trans-industry transforming air travel would become. I would argue that when we digitize textbooks or digitize the chalkboard or digitize the old, boring, time is constant lecture, we're exhibiting the same type of myopic visualization. We're not seeking the new paradigm. We're not thinking big. We're not thinking creative. So to conclude, I propose that we need to make a deal with one another. And I mean a deal between publisher, and, or publisher vendor, and educator, vice versa. You commit to me that you will demand well thought out applications of technology for education with long term strategic goals in mind. I will commit to you that I will help provide guidance around that goal setting in the spirit of partnership. I will deliver on your demands, not just your expectations. You agree to require your players to take a crash course in business. I'll agree to require my players to take a crash course in education. I'm not joking. We collectively commit to applying technology in a planned, sustained, jury, relentless manner. We collectively now acknowledge that we're doing so to improve processes and empower educators, not supplant them. Not supplant them. We commit to creating and sustaining efficiencies, doing more and better with less. And we fine-tune the machine so well that we can step back and choose to apply the old-fashioned method because we know we have this thing so nailed down that a little nostalgic deviation from the refined system feels good, seems right, sounds fun. The key is, at that point, we have a, a, a fail-safe functional system. 
I propose to you that we could not only do better with technology and education, we could do exponentially better. So let us hitch our wagon to a star. Or, as Robert Browning so aptly put it, our reach should exceed our grasp. Or what is heaven for? Thank you very much.